you have your Bible, Psalm, uh, Genesis 37 is where we're going to be. Genesis 37. We are looking over the next several weeks at the life of Joseph. Um, a character that's in the, in the book of Genesis is actually talked about more than any other character in Genesis. He's talked about more than Abraham and Jacob and Isaac. And so we're going to spend quite a bit of weeks just looking at his life and studying uh, what we can learn from his life and how it's applicable for us. Mark Twain once commented that there are two great days in a person's life, the day we're born and the day we discover why. The day we're born and the day we discover why. One of those dates is easier than the other. One is a date in time. It's October 9th or March 8th or May 30th or December 26th. It's a moment you celebrate every year. It's a date when you made your first public, public appearance into this world. That date is easy. The other date isn't so easy. It's probably not a literal date at all. It's the moment when you finally figure out why God has put you on this planet Earth. It's the reason you join 7 billion other people on this ball of dirt that's floating through space. The first date explains your presence here on this earth. The second date explains your purpose on this earth. Oftentimes, it takes a long time to discover why you were born. Sometimes it happens suddenly. Oftentimes, it happens over a gradual process through a series of events. Just a few weeks ago, when the Broncos were getting ready to play the Panthers, prepping for the Super Bowl. The week before, I was listening to sports radio in the morning. That's what I listened to driving to work every morning. Um, and they were talking about Cam Newton. And one of the commentators on the radio made this comment that this is what Cam was born for, that he was born for the scene. Obviously, if you watch the game, you realize that that wasn't what he was born for at all. Um, <laughs> He was an absolute disaster that morning. But that phrase stuck out to me. This is what you were born for. He was born for this. You've heard that statement before, haven't you? And it comes in various variations. Um, she was born to be a mother. He was born to play football. He, she was born to be a leader. He was born to be a pastor. He was born to lead our nation. Um, what were you born to do? That's a hard question. It's one that most of us will probably spend the rest of our lives trying to figure out. But listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, the question goes a little bit deeper than just, what was I born to do? The question is, what is God calling me to do? What is God asking of my life? How is he calling me to live? In Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs would write in Proverbs 3 that if we will trust God with our lives, he will make our path straight, that he will direct our paths. How exactly does he do that? How does God guide us? Even today as we sit here facing decisions and situations in our lives, how do we know that God guides us? Let me share with you Seven truths about God's guidance for you to ponder on. Number one, God can put you exactly where he wants you to be. God can put you exactly where he wants you to be. There's so many of us in this room that were born on the East Coast, but for some reason or another, we're stuck here in Dallas. And I say stuck literally. Um, why? Because God in his plan and purpose can put us exactly where he wants us to be. There's many of you in this room that weren't even born in this nation, but you're here. Why? Because God puts you exactly where he wants you to be. Second thing, God can arrange the details years in advance. You know, we look and we see a week in advance or a month in advance, or we've got plans for our summer plans or something, but God has years down planned already. 
He knows the years that we have left. He knows where we will be to the exact spot 10 years from now. He can plan years in advance. The truth about God's guidance, he's able to open doors in your life that otherwise would seem shut. So many of us in this room can testify, there is no way that this door should have been opened for me. There is no way this should have happened, but God did this. God opened the door for me to get this job. God opened the door for me to get into this school. God provided for me when I didn't think it was possible. Number four, God can remove obstacles that are in our way. Those things that seem to be like, things that seems like, oh, because of this, I can't do this. And all of a sudden, God begins to work and those obstacles begin to disappear. Number five, God can take the choices we make and somehow fit them into his plan so that you will end up at just the right place at just the right time. Here's one. God can take even your mistakes, the times that you screw up and think, man, I messed up. And yet God can take those mistakes and he can use it for his glory and he can use it for your good. And finally, God can use even tragedy and pain and heartache in your life and he can somehow bring good out of it. God guides in amazing ways. This is why the writer of Proverbs would say, in our heart we plan the direction of our life, but really God is the one who determines our steps. Let me ask the question again, why are you born? Why are you alive? Why are you here at this time, in this year, in this season? Why has God put you on this earth? Sometimes we find our calling early. And we know right from a young age, this is what I'm supposed to do. Sometimes the revelation doesn't come till much later in life. Sometimes other people will see it before we do. Sometimes, oftentimes, it's the circumstances of our life that slowly reveal it to us. Joseph is a man who fits that last category. He never knew his purpose of why he existed for many, many years of his life. He never knew why he was born. And it was only after a series of events began to unfold in his life, nearly all of them outside of his control, and many of them quite painful, did the plan of God begin, become so evident in his life. Genesis 37 introduces us to Joseph by telling us three things about this young boy. Number one, he's 17 years old. He's a young guy. Number two, he's working in the family business. He did what his great-grandfather Abraham did, taking care of sheep, what his grandfather Isaac did, and what his father Jacob did. They took care of sheep. And number three, he doesn't have a clue about what his future is going to bring. He has no idea. He realized life is like that. If we talked to Joseph when he was 17 and said, Joseph, why were you born? What are you going to do with your life? He would have no idea. Maybe he would have said, well, my grandfather and great-grandfather and my father were shepherds and they took care of sheep, and so I'm just going to keep doing what they're doing. I'm just going to follow in their footsteps. But in truth, he had no idea the things that God had planned for him. He had no idea the journey that God would take him on. And that strikes me as a crucial point for you to ponder on this morning when you read this story thousands of years later. Because you and I, we know how the story ends. We know everything about Joseph's life and how he ends up becoming prince of Egypt and how he's a great guy and he delivers his family. And that kind of taints our understanding about those early years of Joseph's life. At the age of 17, when he was taking care of his father's sheep, he had no idea where his life was going to be. He had no idea that he was going to one day become a prince. He had no idea that in the midst of that process, he was going to end up in prison, a slave, abandoned by his own family. He had no clue. But at a young age, at 17, all he knew was that he's 17, does sheep, does that well, 
And that's all he knew. See, that's how the will of God is in our lives. God reveals his will to us one step at a time. He doesn't show us the entire blueprint all at once. You take, you take one step, and then he shows you what's next. You go one direction, you follow his leading, and as you take that step, he shows you, here's the next thing I want you to do. And pretty soon, you're at this stage of life, you look back and you realize, man, I used to be there and I'm here. How did that happen? God slowly revealed his will to you one step at a time. That's how God works. I heard someone say that God's will is more like a sunrise than a sunburst. Out of the darkness and the chaos of life, God's will slowly rises over the horizon. It's not so much that we see the sun, but it's that because of the sun, we begin to see everything else. And the same is with God's will. This is true for us, and it was true for Joseph. You begin the story, at the beginning, he was Jacob's son. He was Jacob's favorite son. And then he was betrayed. And then he was sold into slavery. And then he was purchased by Potiphar. Then he rose in Potiphar's house. Then he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. Then he was thrown in prison. Then he met the baker and the butler in prison. Then the butler completely forgot about him. Then one day he stood before Pharaoh. Then he becomes the prime minister of Egypt. Then he meets his brothers. Then he gives his family a home in Egypt. And then he discovers that this is what I was born for. That through me, my family would be saved. And the promise that was given to my great-grandfather Abraham would continue. It took a long time before he discovered, this is, what I, this is why I'm here on this earth. And this morning at Genesis 37, we're at the front end of the story. And as we study this, remember that when we meet Joseph, as he's taking care of his sheep, he doesn't have a clue about the roller coaster ride that he's going to be on. He has no idea. So have that in mind as you read this story. Back up a little bit. There's a word that we use in today's vernacular that perfectly describes Joseph's family. You don't find this word anywhere in Genesis, but it perfectly describes his family. Joseph grew up in a dysfunctional family. His home was messed up. His father had four wives. He had 11 brothers scattered among those four wives. He had one full brother, the youngest child of them all, Benjamin. See, with all of that, there was bound to be trouble, and there was. And then add on to that, Genesis 37, verse 3 says that Joseph was Jacob's favorite child, the son of his old age. It means that he was the son born to his favorite wife, Rachel, the woman that he always loved. Joseph was always his favorite, and all of his brothers knew it. So the family looks like this, one father, four mothers, 12 brothers, one sister, and one favorite son. Listen, it doesn't take a genius to figure out there's going to be issues in this family. Trouble is brewing under the surface in Jacob's complicated family. And out of that family will come Joseph, who many years down the line will rescue the very brothers who betrayed him years before. See, and as the story opens, there's no reason, none at all, to see any of this in advance. At the beginning of this story, the only thing we could see is there's this dysfunctional family with a screwed up dad that picks favorites, and somehow they're supposed to get along together. That's all we can see. I think there's a crucial point for us to learn from that. You and I, our background, it's no impediment for God to use you. Sometimes we make too many excuses of, this is what happened to me, or this is my upbringing, or this is how I was treated. And we use those as excuses to let God use us and work through us. But Joseph's story should encourage you that it doesn't matter what your past is. You serve a God who can redeem your past and use it for his glory and his honor. If you would simply say, God, it doesn't make sense, but I trust you in the midst of this, 
I trust you that you will work. I trust you that you are a good God in control of my life, that you can redeem this for your glory. He can do some great things. Joseph came, comes from a family that was in many ways out of bounds. It wasn't a neat, clean, one man, one woman, nuclear family. He was born into a family with jealousy, competition, and strife and distrust where those were the rules of the game. It wasn't a happy family, and yet God chooses Joseph and works through him mightily. Corey Montiet, Montiet was the star of the hit TV show Glee. He was 31 years old when he died in a hotel room in Vancouver, over an overdose of alcohol and heroin in July of 2013. In 2011, he did an interview with Parade Magazine, and he talked about his past experiences with drugs, and he came to this conclusion. He said, at the end of the day, who everybody meets in the public eye, the public image, and myself are two different people in a way. It's a very accessible version of me. I'm definitely more introverted. I'm definitely darker inside. I'm definitely more at times pessimistic in real life. I shouldn't say pessimistic, that's a little strong. I'm more pragmatic in real life because I come from a whole different body of experience. I don't want kids to think that it's okay to drop out of school and get high and there'll be some famous actors too. I'm lucky on many counts, I'm lucky to be alive. And yet two years after he makes those statements, he's gone. The Bible has a lot to say about this. The Apostle James would write, What is your life? For you are but a mist, here for a little time, but then gone. The psalmist would write, Teach us to number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom. Even Jesus would say, What would it profit you to gain the whole world and yet lose your soul? See, the real problem that we face is not out there. It's not your upbringing, your challenge, the real problem is in here. It's deep inside of you. This is where our greatest battles are ever fought. More than two decades before he died, Michael Jackson sang these lyrics. He said, I'm starting with the man in the mirror, and I'm asking him to change his ways. And no message could be more clearer, could have been more clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make a change. There's a lot of wisdom there, even from Michael Jackson. Um, a lesson we all need to learn. This world is a messed up place. And the most messed up part about this world is our own hearts. Jesus would say, it's out of our hearts that comes all sorts of junk, right? Anger, jealousy, lust. It doesn't come from out there, but it's actually from inside. See, this is one of the reasons why I think the Bible is so true, because it speaks about the human condition in an honest way. It doesn't lie to us about our unlimited potential and what we can become and tell us that basically we're okay the way we are. But the Bible tells us that we're sinners, that we're separated from God, that we're dead in our sin, that we're spiritually blind, that we're unable to help ourselves. This is where the gospel is so relevant. It doesn't make us feel good and then say, just try harder and you'll be okay. The Apostle Paul would write, there's no difference at all. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no difference. There's no difference whether you're rich or you're poor. There's no difference whether you're religious or you're an atheist. There's no difference with four whether you're a Jew or a Gentile or a Muslim or a Christian. There's no difference whether you're young or you're old, whether you're a housewife or a prostitute, a criminal or a choir boy or a U.S. citizen or an international or an undocumented person, there is no difference. We're all in the same boat and unless God does something, we're all going to sing together. See, here's the reality. We're all broken people. Some of us in this room know that. Some of us haven't figured that out yet. Joseph's story is amazing. If you can relate, this story is for you. If you come from a broken home, a messed up home, this story is for you. If you 
Don't get along with your siblings or your brothers and sisters even in Christ. This story is for you. If you've ever been abused or taken advantage of, this story is for you. If you've ever been lied about or lied to, this story is for you. If you've ever felt imprisoned with no hope of ever figuring a way out, this story is for you. If you feel like you're often misunderstood, Joseph's story is for you. So as we dive into Genesis 37, realize there's so much in this story that's just for you this morning. So we begin Genesis 37, and Joseph is standing, taking care of his father's sheep, and he's with his brothers, and he's doing what he thought he would be doing for the rest of his life. If you have your Bibles, Genesis 37 is where we're going to be, and I'm going to quickly summarize this entire chapter, so just keep your eyes open. In the beginning of Genesis 37, he is tending the flock with his brothers in Canaan. At the end of Genesis 37, at the end, he's actually a slave in Egypt. His life has taken, to, has taken a massive turn to what appears to be in the wrong direction. But God had other plans for Joseph's life, plans that require him to be in Egypt. How does a 17-year-old shepherd boy become the prime minister of Egypt? Our chapter highlights just some of the steps that Joseph takes from being a shepherd boy to eventually becoming prime minister. Number one, he starts by taking care of his sheep. Verse 2 says he's 17 years old, pasturing the flock with his, father, with his brothers. That's all he was doing. Number two, he stood for different values than his brothers. Verse 2 continues, says, He was a boy with the sons of Bila and Sophia, his father's wife, wives, and Joseph brought a bad report to them, of them to their father. Joseph knew that some of his father's sons were of low character, and so he shared with his father the things that his siblings were doing. Jacob knew that. Joseph had different values and morals than his siblings. Number three, he was marked out as special from a very young age. Verse three says that Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of the other sons, and he made him a coat of many robes. This is the part of the story that most of us are familiar with, Joseph and his robe of many colors. That phrase, robe of many colors, is hard to translate in Hebrew, but it at least at the minimum means this, a coat that is richly embroidered, most likely with long sleeves, the sort of robes that people of royalty would wear. Now listen, you and I can debate whether Jacob was smart about giving a gift to his favorite son. Perhaps he shouldn't have made his feelings so obvious, but there's nothing in the text that suggests that he did anything wrong at all. But by wearing that robe, Joseph signaled to his brothers that he was destined for greatness in his father's eyes. If the robe had long sleeves, it meant that he couldn't be out there on the field taking care of the sheep like his brothers did. And so his brothers became increasingly angry and hate, hate, hateful toward him. Number four, Joseph began to have two strange dreams. In the first dream, Joseph dreamed that there were these 11 bundles of wheat, and I'm summarizing Genesis 37 for you guys, and he saw that his wheat was there as well, and all these other bundles of wheat would bow down to Joseph. It wasn't too hard for his siblings to figure that out. Joseph was talking about how all of his brothers would one day bow to him, and needless to say, his brothers weren't happy at all with what he shared. But then Joseph has a second dream. The sun is there, the moon is there, and the 11 stars are there, and all of them bow down to Joseph. And now he is implying his father, his mother, and his brothers are all going to bow to him. Number five, this causes his brothers to hate him even more. Notice how things take a downward spiral in the relationship between Joseph and his brothers. Verse four says they hated him. Verse five says they hated him more. Verse eight, they hated him even more. Verse 11, they were jealous of him. No wonder they couldn't speak kindly of him. Verse 4 says that they couldn't say a nice thing about him. Soon their anger and envy will lead to shocking betrayal. This is sad, and it's also instructive for us. Often the closest people 
to us will never recognize God's calling on our lives. Not everyone will applaud your decision to follow Jesus. Some might oppose you openly. Others might think that you're a fool for doing what you're doing. And they'll talk behind your back. In Joseph's case, his brothers were about to commit a heinous crime. They will conspire to kill their own flesh and blood, all because of envy and jealousy. Hebrews 12 warns us that we should see that no root of bitterness begins to come inside of us and cause us trouble. And that's exactly what happens here. They're bitter, and their bitterness eventually comes up with concocting a plan to kill their brother. Envy will not only cause trouble, it will almost destroy this family. And the next thing we see is that Joseph's brothers betray him. Now things begin to unfold quickly. Verse 18, they begin to conspire quickly. Verse 19, they see him coming and they say, let's come up with a plan to kill him. Let's come up with a plan to get rid of him. Verse 20, they plan to kill him and they throw him into a pit. They, verse 24, they throw him into an empty pit. And verse 25, while Joseph is screaming and yelling in a pit, you know what their brothers do? They sit down and have a meal together. Here's their brother in a dark pit, and here's the rest of the brothers having, eating and drinking and having a good time. And then all of a sudden comes these desert traders at just the right moment. And so one of the brothers, Judah, who we'll talk about here in a few weeks, comes up with a clever plan that will so that they can make some money off their brother. So they say, Judah says, it's not going to do us any good to kill Joseph. Why don't we just sell him to these traders? We'll make some money, and we, his blood isn't on our hands. And so the brothers agree. The deal was done. Joseph is sold for 20 pieces of silver, a price of a slave. If that reminds you of someone else who was sold for 30 pieces of silver, it should. In the New Testament, Jesus who was betrayed by Judas, was a distant descendant of Judah who sold his own brother. And now there's only one more detail that remains in Genesis 37. What are they going to say to their father Jacob when Joseph doesn't come home with them? So they take this coat that's richly embroidered, they put blood all over it, they dip it in goat's blood, and they tell the father, some animal has killed jo Joseph. The father believes them, they grieve, and that's how we come to the end of Joseph's story. And at the end of Genesis 37, we find Joseph being sold as a slave in Egypt. He was sold to a man by the name of Potiphar. That's Genesis 37 for you. Take a step back and look at this chapter. It is a despicable story. It is a horrible story of siblings that hate each other. Listen, me and my brother, we grew up, we fought a lot. I don't think I've ever thought about selling him into slavery, right? I mean, I don't think you've done that with your siblings, but this is what their brothers do, and they're okay with it. And they trick their father to do this. Where was God in the midst of this? What was God in the midst of this entire story? Read Genesis 37 again. You will find that God is not mentioned even once in the entire chapter. His name is not there at all. What does that tell us? Does it mean that God somehow abandoned Joseph to his brother's evil schemes? Does it mean that God just let Joseph's life happen as it will? Not at all. What do we conclude from this? Here's what I'd say. Though everything seems to be spinning out of control in Joseph's life, he was exactly where God wanted him to be every step of the way. In the field with his brothers, that's where God wanted him to be. Reporting to his father, telling of his dreams, looking for his brothers, being thrown into a pit, sold as a slave, marched off into Egypt, he was exactly where God wanted him to be. And though the chain of events seemed dark and chaotic to Joseph, it was all leading exactly to where God intended it right from the beginning. Let me give you two lessons from this story. Two things that stand out to me from Genesis 37. Number one, when you are called by God, he will often allow enemies to rise who will put you to the test. 
When you are called by God, he will often allow enemies to arise who will put you to the test. And I'm not saying there's going to be people that attack you, but sometimes when you are called by God, there will be people in your life that will say, why? They'll question you or make you doubt why you're doing what you're doing. I remember when I made the decision to leave my job and go into seminary, some of my closest friends were like, why are you doing that? You're never going to be able to take care of your family. You'll never be able to own a home. You'll always be begging people for money. And that's the life of a pastor. And I was like so discouraged hearing them. Sometimes when you are called by God, people that love you and care for you will often be the ones that the enemy will use to discourage you the most. But you should take heart because that happened to Joseph. It even happened to Jesus. When you live your life for Jesus, not many people will understand why you do the things you do and how you live. But do it anyway. Live for him anyway. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus warned that the enemies sometimes will even come from your own house. So let me encourage you, you shouldn't be surprised when people in your own life sometimes wonder or question why you are living for Jesus the way you do. Because that's what Jesus said should be expected. Lesson number two that stands out to me in this story is when you are called by God, not even your enemies can stop you from doing what God has called you to do. When you are called by God, not even your enemies can stop you from calling what God has called you to do. Joseph had a dream. Somehow or another, others would bow before me. His brothers tried to kill him. His brothers tried to sell him as a slave. When will, when will people ever bow to a slave, they assumed. Listen, if the call of God is on your life, even your enemies can't stop you from doing what God's called you to do. And you know, at the end of Joseph's life in Genesis chapter 50, he will stand before his brothers and he'll tell them to their face, you meant this for evil. All the stuff that you did, you meant it for evil, and they did. They conspired to kill him, but when they realized they could make money off of him, instead of killing him, they sold it for slavery. It was an evil plan through and through. You meant it for evil. But God meant this for good. But God meant this for good. Doesn't God know about the betrayal? Doesn't God know about the slavery? Doesn't God know about Potiphar's wife and how Joseph would be falsely accused? Doesn't God know about all of these false accusations that would happen? Doesn't God know about the time in prison? Doesn't God know that Joseph will be forgotten year after year after year? Doesn't God know? Doesn't God care? Can I suggest that God knew all of those things and even more details that we don't even know about in Scripture? But, God, but Joseph was God's choice. And so God would allow Joseph to go through pain and hardship and difficulties and trials. It had to happen that way. At the beginning of the story, Joseph is taking care of sheep in his father's house. At the end of the story in Genesis 37, he's a slave in Egypt. And you've got to ask the question, is he better off or is he worse off? At the beginning, he was just taking care of sheep and all he had to worry about was his brothers that hated him. He had his father who loved him. At the end, he was a slave, a possession owned by another man. Was he better off? Was he worse off? How you answer that depends on your point of view. It depends on how big your God is. 
it depends on if you are able to trust that God doesn't just have me in the good times, but he's also God when everything is rough and he's in control. Some of you this morning are going through hardships and you're saying, God, where are you? And Joseph's story is a reminder to you that the same God that took care of you when life was good and everything was perfect is the same God that's with you this morning. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't abandon you. Your steps are ordered by him. He's got you. And so that brings us back to the quote by Mark Twain. There are two great days in a person's life. The day we're born and the day we discover why. It takes a long, long time for Joseph to figure out why he was on this earth. When we come to the end of Genesis 37, he doesn't know it yet. One person says it best this way. He said, I was born to serve God. Everything else is just details. I was born to serve God. Everything else in life is just details. See, seen in that light, the true hero of this story is not Joseph, it's God. The whole story illustrates how God can accomplish his purpose for us even when we are clueless about the big picture of our lives. See, that comforts me because I rarely see the big picture. I rarely know what God is up to. I rarely can put pieces together. And what little I do understand happens as I look back and see, oh, that's why I had to go through that. That's why I had to experience that season in my life. That's why God took me through that pain. And now I can look back and say, I see these pieces fitting together. Even this morning, I have no idea what tomorrow or the day after will bring, much less what the next five years will bring. God has a blueprint for our lives. He does. We can rest in assurance knowing that the blueprint of our lives is in the hands of someone who knows what to do with it. You're not going to see the whole blueprint at once. But he'll slowly reveal it step by step, day by day. That was true for Joseph. It's true for you. It's true for me. We serve a God who is faithful. Sometimes things don't turn out the way we think it should turn out. But in the hands of a God who knows every detail of your life, it's turning out exactly the way he wants it to be. Because you'll eventually look back and you'll see all the pieces fit together. And you'll see, God, it makes sense. You don't see it now. You might not even see it in this lifetime. But listen, your life is not wasted. You belong to him. You are loved by him. And he has a plan for you. And you can trust him with the details of your life. How do we know that? We know that because when we were dead in our sins, when we had no access to the Father, what did he do? He sent his son to die for my sins and your sins. And then he freely offers grace and forgiveness to us so that we can come to the throne room of grace and call him Father and know that we are loved. Know that he is a good, good Father. This table we celebrate week in and week out is a reminder to us that he's a God who knew us. He knew us in all of our sin and all of our weaknesses. And yet he loved us anyway. And in his perfect time, he called us to be a part of his family. He sent his Holy Spirit to live inside of us. We are never left alone. We belong to him. As you come to the table this morning, may the reminder that you belong to God stick with you. And that this table is a reminder that the price was paid 
so that he can call you son and he can call you daughter and you can call him father. I'm going to invite you to take a moment to examine your attitudes, your affections, your desires. And whenever you're ready, if you would, you can come and grab the elements from the table. And if you could, come through the middle aisle and go down the um, aisles on the sides so that there's not a bottleneck up here. But whenever you're ready, come and grab the elements. This morning, maybe you're here and you want someone to pray with you. We're going to have folks on either side available to pray. So whenever you're coming up for communion and you just want someone to just pray with you, you can, if you're welcome, you just come, stop, and have one of us pray with you. Um, and then you can go back to your table. But let's just spend some time in worship. As soon as communion's done, we're going to continue back in worship. So let's seek God's face together. Let's worship. Thank you.